Good morning, uh, wherever you are. Thank you for those who have uh, appeared in this meeting. And those who will uh, watch it online, you are also welcome. Today we are continuing on with a series. We have been doing a series in our church on fighting Jesus in the old scripture. And the motivation is uh, an encounter of uh, Jesus with two of the disciples who are walking away from a murder scene and that is Jerusalem, and they were going towards a city that is called um, Emmaus. It is on that route that we are told in Luke 24, verse 15, Jesus himself approached and began traveling with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. This morning, therefore, as we look at the scripture that we, are, uh, we have just read, I'm speaking to you who is out there, whose prevailing circumstances probably brought by the pandemic or even brought by the political environment in your country or brought about even by the nuclear family, how what, the things that are happening in the family. It is you that I'm speaking to whose prevailing circumstances may make your mind not clearly uh, see the presence of Jesus in your life at this point in time. This was the case with the disciples that we are looking at. The humiliation and progging and eventual death of uh, our Christ in the passage that we are just looking at was gruesome. It was cruel and perhaps the most um, humiliating form of death and eventual crucifixion crucifixion on the cross. We may never tell the pain that he had to endure, but if you look at verse 26 of Luke 24, before we get into the scripture now, it says this, was it not necessary that Christ should suffer these things and enter into his holy glory or enter into his glory in other words when he asks was it not necessary it appears to me or it sounds to me like he is answering a question of why should christ have died as opposed to how he died and therefore today my intention is really to paint a picture of why christ had to die in this um in this uh, gr uh, gruesome and um, most unsettling way. We have um, a 3D image uh, hung in our uh, hung in our uh, table room of a swan. If you look at it in one perspective, you will see a white swan. If you look at it in another perspective, you see a black swan. And the black swan phenomenon or black swan event has been described to have three characteristics. One, it is rare. Number two, it is extreme in impact. And number three, in retrospect, one can look, see or feel the predictability. And I feel like Jesus is now trying to bring out the black swan event uh, from what has just happened in the week of the Passion, or the Passion of the Christ. To the disciples, it was an ordinary death, and they could not understand why this ordinary death had to be done in such a horrible way, and perhaps even more so, why it should be done to their master, someone that they have worked with, someone whom they perceived as a leader, as a king of the Jews, why he had to go through such humiliation, they couldn't understand that. But Christ is trying to bring out that there, this is a rare event, yes, and that this event is going to have such an impact in the lives of the people to come, and you who are here today. And also, it is not just an event that has happened. For it is written in the scriptures. And therefore, when we are told in verse 27 of Luke 24, and beginning with Moses and the prophets, he interpreted to them 
in all in all the scriptures and things things concerning himself in other words he is now taking them back in time the book of isaiah presents the week of the passion about 700 years before the actual event and therefore them being jews and having studied the scriptures and memorized them should have picked it up and knew that this is an exact replica of what has been predicted by our prophets but no the events the surrounding circumstances that were then perhaps the sorrow the sadness of losing their master had clouded their mind such that they could not be able to bring out what they had read in the scriptures and reconcile it with the events that are as we look at the scripture therefore i am trying to bring out an image of the black swan event an event that is rare an event that is impactful and an event that on hindsight one can see it could have been predicted that there is a purpose of this christ dying in the way that he has died but let us look um, more into the image that i'm trying to bring out and that has been pre prescribed in Isaiah 52 uh, from verse 13 all the way to Isaiah 53 verse 12. Looking at it, one can see a sort of image where it starts with the exaltation of Christ, ends with the vindication of Christ, but in between here is a very humiliating and sorrowful and painful moment at least of the Christ that adds up in death. If you would bring out the image um, that I'm trying to bring out. So one can see exaltation, vindication, but in between here, a deep valley of death. And this can be seen in the uh, form of a biphasic wave of his suffering. Exaltation, deep down the valley into death, and then vindication of the Christ. The roll down from exaltation to death, although the image that you are seeing in your, in your screens looks very smooth, was one that is very rough. It is sort of a tumbling down the valley, hit by rocks and whatever other things that are there, the thorns and the thimbles, whatever else is, 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 is along the way, rolling down the valley until you hit the rock bottom. The rock bottom, if you can remember our study on the route to the mouse, the rock bottom is exactly where the disciples were. They had hit rock bottom. So for our scripture, therefore, I want us to look at it differently. One would have looked at it as in form of the events that happened, how gruesome and horrible they were. But I want to break it down in a different way into five different topics. The first one is exaltation, as we have just said, and that will be in three verses, verse, 20, verse 13 to 15 of Luke, uh, of uh, Isaiah 52. Then the humiliation, Isaiah 53, verse 1 to 3. Expiation, which actually just means the, the act of extinguishing um, sin or guilt. And resignation, which says he chose not to speak. Uh, that would be in three other verses. And finally, vindication. If we were to look at the exaltation, therefore, verse 13 begins in an interesting way. It says, Behold my servant. Behold is an emphasis. It tells you, take a serious look. Consider with deepest, most concentrated attention. And my servant here means without a will of his own, but the will of the Father. In other words, whatever he's going to do is not a will of his own, but that of the Father. One can therefore um, summarize this. Um, uh, before we summarize it, so behold my servant, then it says, will prosper. Other translations do not say that. They say, behold my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. The world, world English Bible translates this also as wisely. 
Behold, my servant shall deal wisely. He shall be exalted and lifted up and shall be very high. Prudence is different from wisdom. For prudence is wisdom in action. Proverbs 8 verse 12 tells us, I, wisdom, dwells with prudence. In other words, these are interrelated, wisdom and prudence. So we are told that the, whatever action that Jesus has got himself into, or the servant has got himself into during this suffering, is a prudent will, is a prudent decision he has entered willingly. We can therefore summarize this and say, Take a serious look and consider with most concentrated attention to him who does only the will of the Father, for he, act, he acts in absolute prudence, and in doing so, he prospers or excels. Because of his excellence, he will be high, he will be lifted high, and he will be greatly exalted. Jesus tells us, therefore, this prudence from heaven, not Jesus, but the book of James tells us this. That is James chapter 3 verse 17. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then perceivable, or peaceable. It is gentle, it is reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering and without hypocrisy. This is the wisdom that Jesus is entering himself into over the entire week of the passion. Humiliation. Over the years in the churches, we have been very good at um, preaching three types of bearings or two types of bearings. The first one is bearing the cross, which uh, simply means physical suffering, the bearing the physical suffering. We have also been very good at uh, preaching the bearing of sin, that is the spiritual suffering of Jesus so that he can redeem, redeem us. What we have not been very good at, at least in this part of the world, is preaching on bearing of the shame. So there are three bearings, bearing of the cross, bearing of sin, and bearing of shame. This is least discussed, I think, is because of the cultures of here. The culture that Jesus was, was a shame culture. It was one where um, those who have it, those who are good, those who are considered uh, uh, okay, were lifted high. Those ones who are considered weak, or those ones who are least considered, considered lesser in society were shamed in all sorts of, sorts of ways. And therefore, it is the humiliation that the culture in that setting was more worried about. And what the early teachings really talk about the humiliation or want to bring out more of humiliation than bringing out anything else. It is the humiliation of him who is on the cross even not uh, being bestowed the honor of having some clothes to hide his nakedness. And Joe Hellerman, who is a professor in New Testament, says this. He writes this uh, about an old teaching in this passage. He who hung on earth is fixed there. He who made all things fast is made fast upon the tree. The master has been insulted. God has been murdered. The king of Israel has been slain by an Israelitish hand. Oh, strange murder, strange crime. The master has been treated in a seemly fashion, his body naked and not even deemed worthy of covering, that is, his nakedness. He might not be seen, so that his nakedness might not be seen. Therefore, the lights of heaven turned away and the day darkened and it might hide him who, has, who was stripped upon the cross. So there is no mention of the gruesome murder it is actually the humiliation that they are more worried about. Humiliation, although um, treated to Christ, was an intention that he had to face 
so that those who are humiliated in society because of their circumstances, because of their sin, because of their weakness, may find favor in the eyes of God and also in the eyes of men. Ultimately, as we shall see later, vindicated. Humiliation comes before exaltation. It is the shame and humiliation that was then was, was more highlighted in this culture, yet we know that this path is a choice that he made with prudence. Let us look at expiation. We say that expiation is an act of um, extinguishing guilt. Jesus has gone through humiliation and even unto death. The flood of blood and water, as we have been told, after him, him being pierced, if one was to look at, has flowed on the floor of the cross. And therefore, if one was to think of the image that we had when we were beginning, exaltation, death, and um, uh, another exaltation or vindication, that form of valley if one was to look at a flowing blood uh, that reflects on this dying Christ, the image that is going to be reflected on the blood that is flowing is an inverted image of what we are seeing. So instead of seeing exaltation, death, and vindication, we shall see an image of exaltation, death, and vindication. In other words, at the height, at the peak of his suffering and death is the height of his joy or the height of our, of our redemption. Which means that our, the, extingu the extinguishing of our sin or of our guilt happened at the peak of his pain. This is the curve of our redemption. The curve of, of expiation where it is that height of his pain where he receives his utmost joy. This is the apex of his excruciating pain where he is abandoned even by his, by his father. Yet the mirror image of his flowing blood reflects an inverse image of his suffering and death. The apex of his pain is the climax of his mission and that is our redemption. It is the height of his suffering that he achieves his ultimate intention, and that is our redemption. The reconciliation of us and the Father is accompanied, is accomplished at the height of his pain. Our guilt has been extinguished. Our sin has been atoned. We too can be vindicated together with him. There is a lot that can be said about uh, these topics, but let's go quickly now to resignation. As we rightly said, because of his prudence, he entered into this path of suffering unto death. And because of his prudence, therefore, whatever is going to be done to him, he chooses not to say a word. And that is what is said in verse 7 of the scripture that we have just read. In his prudence, he chose to walk this path. He chose not to speak, but to resign to mockery, humiliation, pain, and suffering. He had his eye on the ultimate price, and that is the reconciliation of you and me to his father by bearing the full cost of sin, as is written in verse 8. And because of this prudence, because of this choice that he has made, therefore, he gets us now into vindication. He had done no violence. That is what is said. We are being told by verse 9b. Nor was there deceit in his mouth. Verse 12 says, He himself bore the seed of many and interceded for transgressors. In other words, it has been vindicated, or he has been vindicated at the cross, that it was not him who sinned, but us. And that he, by his death, has redeemed us. The many who are watching him at the cross, 
he redeemed them from their transgression. This is the vindication. This is the second exaltation that we saw in our curve of his humiliation. You know, this is not just a good description, a good story that is being told. It's the story of our lives. And the story of our lives closely mirrors that one of Christ. We shall at times be very high, very excited about the happenings of our lives. But eventually things do tumble down, down into a valley. We may not die, but the spirit in us feels so, so low, such as to be dead or rock bottom. And then there is an element of being lifted up either by close friends or Christ's words or some music, and then again high. So it is a very close image that we have with that one of Christ. Having high, low moments and high again is our typical day. We are in one such year where the pandemic has set us so, so low. But I don't know exactly where you are in your life. It may be that you are at a moment that is very high in your life. It may be that you have lost your job, you have lost your spouse, you have lost your health, you have lost just anything that you know, and nothing makes sense anymore. You are in the depth of your valley. So that as we consider this scripture, as we listen and look at the image of the Christ crucified, and that that, we have, that has been described by Isaiah, we see Christ's blood that is flowing from his ribs in the wake of the passion, reflecting a completely different image. For him who receives him, the image that we get is not that image of his suffering, but rather it is the image of our redemption, where the aspects of his suffering mirrors more your redemption, mirrors more your victory. So it is in the height of his pain that he is going, he is going to give you victory. Those who receive him receive forgiveness receive redemption so that as he is vindicated that he is not guilty anymore we are vindicated we are not guilty anymore for he has carried the guilt of sin my question to you is where are you in your life do you feel christ's presence in you can you Testify that you can see him walking along with you. Has he revealed this black swan moment to you? If not, please write to one of the, our pastors. Please contact us so that someone can pray with you. We have read in Luke 15, and as they talked and deliberated, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. It is Jesus himself who is showing up in the scriptures of Isaiah to walk along with you in these very difficult circumstances. And the grand scheme of the week of the Passion was prophesied and documented 700 years ago or before the event. What he wanted is to inform the disciples that these events were real and deliberate. They were choreographed to begin with his edification or exaltation and add with his vindication. But perhaps even better is that these events were entered in his prudence and the edification and vindication of him, yes, but it is perhaps even more intentional that you receive your redemption and ultimate vindication because of his death or his suffering and ultimate vindication. So that as he is vindicated, you are vindicated. My friends, we shall stop it here, but it is our prayer that through these sufferings and 
moments of pain that we are in, through the circumstances that you are in, you also can feel Christ walking in you, as has been described by the book of Isaiah. And that you can see his exaltation bringing your redemption, his suffering bringing your redemption, and ultimately your redemption being bringing vindication in as much as him being vindicated at the cross. Have you known him? Do you feel him? Do you see him? Have you had the scriptures revealed to you about this black swan moment? It is our prayer that you will, if you let him, to do that. Let us pray. Thank you, Father, because you are God and you love us and that you know us in our lowest moments. We pray that you come and walk with us so that him who does not know you among us may know you and feel you. Him who knows you yet has been through circumstances that are very difficult may also be uplifted by your redeeming grace and that by your vindication we also may be vindicated. In Jesus' name.